other uh, grants to Hope Foundation that I'm going to say here. Um, so if you go to the Hope Foundation website, you can see all the documentary squad for the exploration of the um, applications that are due December 1st. The Charles Coyne oh, Junior Fellowship which supports a two year mentor fellowship for $2,000 a year. So you have a the Squad Hope Foundation Impact Award, the letter of intent for this is due in January next year. Innovative squad research leverage new resources from trials for directly studies. And the squad career engagement award uh, again this is due next year in March for three two years uh, fifty thousand dollars each. Again, all these are listed on the Hope Foundation website. Yeah, and that's right. So uh, Dr. Catherine did want to, and all of us know, the new NCI director uh, is a surgeon, Monica Bertignoli, um, formerly at, um, at Brigham, um, now is a new NCI director, and so it's great to have an NCI director as a surgeon. Um, there, right now, we do have ongoing elections for the new SWAG group chair. Um, Dr. Michael LeBlanc, our group statistician, is leading the search. So, if you do have people you want to nominate, please send these by December 1st to Dr. LeBlanc. Um, and then, as well, oh, now, yesterday, Dr. LeBlanc moved on. Uh, Bobby will come now. Uh, yeah, now we did that. Uh, 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 vice chair. Hey, so, uh, people on Zoom were. I don't know if he's on here. I don't know. No, I'm saying no, but I'm saying that he can't spray. I don't know. Whatever he said. Any questions? I just have a quick question about it. Between audio and this, yeah, it's all good. We're working. So, so most of these uh, groups uh, and uh, eight protocols, and they have one to be open for three and two um, that's being worked on reactivation. I think support groups like surgery won't we'll, we'll have one, but um, I think that's still in the problem. We don't have an infrastructure. How do you have any insights to that? Yeah, I thought, you know, I mean, I mean, that is that new model that takes working uh, and the results are going to talk to you. Groups like ours can really um, uh, sponsor. Um, you know some of the the concepts that that Josh and John Hingstrom are developing in terms of melanoma. Again, these are things that are these are something that we'll keep pushing. So with that, uh, our invited speaker today is Dr. Hagen uh, Kenecki from uh, um, Portland. He's an associate member of the Earl Charles Research Institute, Providence Cancer Institute, and he's really been a leader in the in the on the national level in terms of um, the state of science in how we manage rectal cancer, uh, moving away from trimodality therapy. Uh, and so, Hagen, to give us a talk on that. Can we get the, uh, his slides up? Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm at the Providence Cancer Institute in Portland, just across the river from Flavio, and. Uh, we are still close together. We were before we were at Virginia Mason together, so we, we didn't uh, move too far. Um, so we want. I want to. I was asked to talk about uh, rectal cancer, which is uh, near and dear to my heart, and uh, some of the major changes that we are hopefully starting to see uh, clinically. So, I mean, still the snapshot of rectal cancer in 2022 is. You know, we the standard still is surgery, and uh, which involves a loss of an organ with TME, and uh, because about twenty five percent of tumors are low, that results in a bag, 
in 25% of patients. So if you look at phase two, three trials of stage two, three rectal cancer, that's, that's really a fairly consistent uh, ostomy rate. Um, the issue of local regional relapse has been addressed uh, through first uh, uh, through improved surgery and as well as radiation. However, we still have high systemic rates of relapse and uh, making colorectal cancer the number two cause of cancer death in North America. And the other major issue is uh, we have toxicity, uh, particularly when you uh, combine surgery and radiation. And there has not been uh, for a while any uh, surgery alone uh, trials, but if you look at the Dutch data uh, of TME versus TME plus radiation, uh, you really see um, the, the price of radiation is really a threefold increase in grade three, four uh, toxicity in, in terms of incontinence and, um, uh, and uh, bowel function, bladder function, sexual function, particularly in males. And that, uh, that's five years later. And then uh, more recent updates, 14 years later, that toxicity is still there. As we know, radiation is the gift that keeps giving. So, um, so really the moves as a result of all these factors is we are trying to remove a move away from treating everyone with uh, all three modalities. And in the, for radiation, we're trying, we're, we've done trials to use it more selectively. For surgery, there's uh, many <clears throat> trials of a non-operative management, uh, or, aka watch and wait, or doing less invasive surgery, organ sparing surgery, transanal excisional surgery, TES, that our colorectal cancer colleagues do. And with chemotherapy, we are escalating and de-escalating based on CGDNA. So those are the three elements I wanted to touch on today. So um, this actually was just published yesterday. It was online a little bit earlier, but we, we did a, a study um, uh, of N an NCDB analysis of, and we wanted to see, you know, what's going on right now with patients with stage two, three rectal cancer that are being treated with trimodality therapy. So, so we did a, an analysis and looked at patients <clears throat> included and diagnosed with stage two, three uh, rectal cancer between 2006 and 2016. And uh, they had to have uh, had received all three modalities. And uh, we identified a total of 32,000 individuals. And we looked at how they're treated and we really uh, classified them into four different distinct groups. Uh, the one group was TNT. The second group was uh, pre-op um, chemo radiation and uh, post-op uh, single agent chemo. The third group was uh, pre-op chemo radiation and post-op multi-agent, that's the MA chemotherapy. And then the last group, group D, which thankfully was progressively declining, uh, is patients that were treated with post-op radiation and uh, uh, multi-agent chemo. So as you can see, the most dramatic and um, positive finding really has been uh, over that decade, a significant decline in patients getting post-op radiation, and, uh, and and all those patients essentially moved to either <clears throat> uh, getting uh, a post-op uh, pre-op uh, uh, radiation followed by post-op chemotherapy, multi or single agent. Interestingly, the uh, TNT we didn't really witness in, uh, increase a lot, and actually there was a trend that it would it was decreasing, and I think part of that is that in the kind of era before 2010, we were doing a lot of combina combination um, <clears throat> chemotherapy, including oxaliplatin with radiation. And that kind of in the NCDB database, it flagged that really counted as TNT, which we know it's not really. So, so that, that's kind of a limitation of the database. So we also looked at, you know, what's what's been the change over that same era in P stage, and as as you might recall, these were all predominantly clinical stage two, three patients, and then we correlated the pathologic stage. And over that time period between 2006 and 2016, we saw a progressive decline and a lower uh, stage of. Um, uh, uh, of tumors, particularly the uh, notable downstaging was found in the clinical stage three. 
And then we looked at mortality and risk of death, and we found that there was overall between comparing uh, 2006 and 2016 mortality, there was a reduction in risk of death um, in, and the hazard ratio was 0.77. So overall, you know, it was that just because of the change in sequence of therapy, was that because of improvements in surgery and post-op care, uh, there was, uh, you know, it, so this was really a, a much closer look at what's going on with rectal cancer. So that that's, I think, a, um, um, a reflection of, of where we were about five years ago. So how did we get there? So this is a study, this is a summary of, of kind of the major uh, literature in, uh, of radiation that um, has influenced our current modern management. And uh, I've listed the, the date of the study and, and the, the country where the, most of the trial was done. And you know, if you think way back in 1997, the, the Swedish <clears throat> published trial of a short course, in this case, of radiation, um, followed by surgery versus surgery alone. And, and that resulted in a profound reduction in local recurrence. And I think one of the uh, notable things there is that with surgery alone, the local regional recurrence was 27% versus 11%. That is actually the only uh, radiation study that um, resulted in a overall survival benefit, and and you know that uh, that probably makes sense given the high rate of recurrence. And then the Dutch um, said, well, now that we're doing better surgery with TME, do we really need radiation? So that's what the 2001 study was, and I think the notable conclusion was um, you still had a benefit of radiation with a similar hazard ratio of 0.5, uh, but the local regional occurrence was much lower, 11 versus 6% with radiation versus not. And then the Germans did this study saying, hey, should we do it before, should we do it uh, after? And that was relevant because in America, you know, the 1990 American trial uh, really was uh, post-op radiation. So they did a very nice study and they found that uh, pre-op versus post-op hemoradiation was not only more effective with a hazard ratio of 0.5, but less toxic. So that's that really kind of fed into the change uh, in, uh, you know, that was a, it's a big uh, commission on cancer quality metric of not receiving post-op radiation. Um, then there was countless uh, negative trials of adding systemic agents to uh, radiation, which were quite surprisingly negative. In 2014, mainly through the work of people like Gina Brown uh, done in the UK, uh, we really have incorporated and standardized the use of MRI in rectal cancer staging. And the two major things that you know, she taught us is this, what is the CRM? So, so the circumferential radial margin and is there EMVI? And that was, those two elements are so important when it comes to local regional control that the ESMO changed their guidelines uh, in 2017, indicating that if you have a stage two, three rectal cancer tumor um, <clears throat> that is a CRM clear with no EMVI, you actually don't need radiation. So they're a little bit of ahead of, uh, ahead of us, <clears throat> and of course that and that means you have to you know, have to you need excellent MRI. study is finally going to be presented at ASCO 2023. So that's the radiation. What about chemotherapy? So also a fairly long and rich history. Um, uh, there's uh, plenty of national international trials uh, using either six or 12 months of 5-FU uh, and in some cases uh, addition of leucoborin chemotherapy. And overall, if you look at all of those trials, the, uh, the reduction in risk of relapse as a result of chemotherapy, five of you chemotherapy is a hazard ratio of 0 0.6 for node positives and 0 0.8 for node negatives. Um, there's a survival advantage in node positives and not, but not node negatives. So we then, we also found out that uh, in six versus 12 month trials that six was enough. So six was the standard. And then in 2004, the French added oxaliplatin to uh, the same Indigramont infusional regimen and further 
uh, found an additional reduction in risk of relapse uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.6. So if you add the 0.6 together plus the 0.76, that's about, I tell my patients about a 55% uh, uh, reduction in risk of relapse as a result of six months of chemo. And then we did a whole bunch of trials saying, well, we should do renotecan or we should add bevacizumab or cetuximab and none of those worked. And then in 2017, we compared uh, through multiple international trials enrolling more than 12,000 patients. We compared six versus three months, a full FOX or KPOX. And the result was three equals six if you had an intermediate risk colon cancer T1 to T3 and one. But if you had a higher risk tumor, uh, you should get six months of therapy. In 2020, uh, this is, while the other trials have been predominantly colon cancer, uh, in 2020, uh, the, uh, we heard a specific rectal cancer trials, and that looks like a Tommy Hilfiger logo, but it is a superimposed Dutch flag and French flag, the Perdiz trial and the uh, Repito trials. They enrolled patients to stage 2-3 rectal cancer and randomized them to total neoadjuvant therapy um, versus post-op chemotherapy and overall TNT was superior with the exact same hazard ratio in both trials of 0.7. So that really has shifted the therapy. It's really changed our practice uh, in, in rectal cancer with a lot of implications. This year at ASCO, we heard um, what about adjuvant therapy, about the use of a CTDNA um, in the management of adjuvant therapy. And I'll present that trial a little bit later. And there is a, that was published in New England Journal. Lots of ongoing work of escalation and de-escalation in CTDNA that I'm going using CTDNA that I'm gonna present at the end of the uh, presentation, as well as dose escalation of therapy including targeted therapy in, uh, in the adjuvant setting. So here are the two TNT trials and the Prodige is on your left. And they actually did two things. They, uh, so they took um, uh, standard risk stage two, three rectal cancer, and they <clears throat> treated them with uh, either standard chemo rads followed by uh, post-operative full FOX chemo. And they were very careful the two that everyone got the post-op chemo versus full FOX theory for three months followed by chemo radiation and then a surgery and then three more months of full FOX. And overall, there was a improvement in disease-free survival. And these two trials were actually really nice because the, we pivoted from a whole bunch of trials using local regional control as a primary endpoint to disease-free survival, which is really what we need to do, right? So these, um, these were, had the disease-free survival endpoint and the hazard ratio was 0.7, um, and they, it was a significant improvement. The Rapido, the Dutch, they actually took slightly higher risk patients. They gave them uh, uh, stage two, three rectal cancer, bulky tumors, low tumors, gave them short course radiation in the experimental uh, arm, uh, followed by four months of chemo, followed by surgery, versus long course chemo radiation, then surgery, and then a hodgepodge of post-op chemo. Actually, 30% of them didn't even get post-op therapy. Regardless, still very same hazard ratio seen um, uh, with with the in the experimental arm. Interestingly, local recurrence was uh, was maybe a little bit higher in the sh short course plus chemo arm, but uh, that wasn't significant. So, so um, still lots of interest. You know, this is a, a trial that Lisa and I designed and uh, we're doing it at Columbia and UC Irvine and Earl Childs uh, of an, another version of TNT. Uh, using short course radiation, followed by a Tazox regimen, trying to introduce a new adjuvant um, uh, agent into the into the uh, treatment of rectal cancer. So the schema is uh, intermediate, kind of a, a prospect population of resectable non-low rectal tumors treated with short course, uh, followed by three months of chemotherapy with uh, Tazox and followed by surgery. Uh, so we're kind of halfway through that trial and we'll be reporting it uh, hopefully in the next couple of years. 
So, so again, then to recap, we've really, the, 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 the treatments and the framework of rectal cancer has really changed from the traditional sandwich to the T and T sandwich. And then there is another question about, hey, do you do chemo first and then radiation and then surgery or the reverse sequence? And we're going to go over a study that looked at that question. But overall, we're really, you know, a lot of the questions are trying to move to a bimodality strategy. And these are, there's various strategies and, and there's various different subtypes of rectal tumors, aren't they? And, and the low tumors are really stand on their own because, you know, age of colorectal cancer is going down. You don't, you telling a 50 year old dude that he's going to have a bag for the next 30 years of his life sucks. So there's enormous amount of interest in, in doing something for these patients. And, and that really is um, primarily in the form of watch and wait. And that was the OPRA trial that we'll look at uh, um, after TNT. What about the non-low CRM clear, the prospect population? We're looking at one approach that we'll see whether it changes practice is chemo first and then selective radiation and then surgery. I think it's gonna be, a, it's a big question, of, even if that trial is positive, whether we're gonna have, you know, what, you know, how, how's that going to compete with our, our watch and wait discussions with patients, which involves radiation first. And then there's the high risk, which uh, rectal cancer, low, uh, as well as, you know, the bulky stage two threes. Uh, we're definitely wanting to give them um, a TNT and, and Dr. Josh Smith is uh, leading a Janus trial of, of dose escalation of therapy with Fulpirinax. And then finally, the other subpopula subpopulation is the DMMR tumors um, and that uh, we'll look at the data on. So briefly, I'm going to try to, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, I'll start to fly through these trials a, a, a little quicker. So um, you know, the, the concept of uh, watch and wait really is in the setting of TNT, and um, it is after giving both radiation and chemotherapy. And as of 2020, NCCN guidelines reflected that that is a option to discuss with patients if patients have a clinical complete response. And so there's lots of um, history about the watch and wait, and there's lots of uh, champions of it, Habar Gama, and it really, you know, started the observation. And, you know, Dr. Montana is really, uh, 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 sorry, Gar Garcia Aguilar has been uh, really very active in, in that field and, and a big champion of this. And, and the rationale really is to avoid surgery in patients with a complete response to therapy. And <clears throat> initially, this literature really was all in patients with low tumors, as is the OPRA trial, actually. And it was patients that either had chemo first followed by radiation or the reverse sequencing, and then they had imaging. And if they had a, a near complete or complete response, you did watch and wait, which is fairly intensive with Q2 monthly endoscopy and Q6 monthly MRI and surgery only if there's evidence of recurrence. And, over, and overall, even before OPRA, if you look at the literature, it suggests that you know, a minority of patients with this approach end up avoiding surgery because in spite of an initial good response, they do, and, and you know, many uh, uh, may recur or they never completely uh, re re resolve in the first place. It, delaying the, the definitive surgery does not seem to have um, adverse impact on distant disease. So that was, that's an important observation, right? And uh, we, we do see higher local regional relapse rates with watch and wait, which of course are salvaged in the majority of cases, but of course we also see a lower risk of colostomy. So that's really the overall observations. We have some uh, um, uh, prospective evidence of, of this approach. Uh, really, OPRA was the first trial of that. Um, and it took uh, uh, quite a large study of stage two, three low rectal tumors, um, 325. And they were um, randomized to induction chemo followed by chemo radi or radiation followed by, uh, or the reverse sequence. And then they had the option to do non-operative management or standard surgery. 
And so overall, the initial results presented in 2020 shows that there was a, 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 um, a higher rate of uh, avoiding TME surgery if you actually started with radiation. So that it was actually quite consistent with a previous German trial that uh, found a higher PCR rate simply by uh, doing the radiation first and then letting the chemo do the work after perhaps giving the, ther the radiation therapy longer time to work. So this was then published this year uh, with more mature outcomes. And overall, uh, there was uh, a significant difference in uh, favor of the induction radiation arm. And, um, but you can see that overall the organ sparing the rate was about 50% in, in both arms, uh, pretty good. And then the graph on the right-hand side looks at the important question of, is there any um, harm in of delayed surgery? And so they took um, uh, patients that required TME at uh, right after completion of therapy or that had a TME during the course of uh, watch and wait. And overall, there was no significant difference in uh, disease-free survival uh, compared to those two groups. So that's an important question to look at. You know, what, you know, I think one of our, our big experience with watch and wait, of course, is you don't really know who is going to get a complete response, right? And so you are, again, treating everyone the same way. It's kind of like back in you know, 20 years ago, we, we didn't do personalized therapy. Everyone gets everything, and then you just hope for the best. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is the uh, watch the TNT intensification study that, that we will be opening in the next three months, likely, which is called Janus. And it is a high-risk rectal population and randomized to induction radiation. Uh, followed by either full FOX or full Ferinox, and the primary endpoint is complete clinical response. That study has about, uh, I think it's got a, like uh, just under 300 patients uh, to it. Okay. So we look forward to participating in that. I, and I think it's really going to, that trial is really going to you know, bring watch and wait uh, really to a, a much greater fold. I mean, the, the Oprah study actually was only done in, in 13 centers in, across America. And, and so, so this really is, you know, the NC, NCTN mechanism is, you know, thousands, thousands of sites. And hopefully that's where we'll get much more comfort with watch and wait. Immunotherapy and colorectal cancer, just a very a brief look at this. Um, uh, uh, most uh, uh, <clears throat> colorectal cancer is PMMR and, and really, um, uh, sorry, let's be that. <laughs> yeah, that was just the current <laughs> literature suggests, um, having done a couple of uh, advanced trials uh, that immune checkpoint inhibitors are ineffective. PDL1 is not predictive. Uh, the uh, agents are approved uh, for advanced TMB high and tumors. However, still lots of interest in, in this question, PM, PMMR setting in earlier stage disease, of course, and in, in combination with TKI and BRAF mutants. Much, much different in the DMMR setting. And DMMR, you know, is enriched in the early stage tumors and is um, uh, much less common in the advanced these are tumors, like they look aggressive, they have a high mutation burden, but they're not very good at metastasizing. And, you know, they spread locally, they become quite large, but they, they, they just don't have the biology of spreading to the liver or the lung. So that's why you see this stage distribution. Uh, but if you do have advanced disease, uh, uh, that is D DMMR, you have a very high disease control rate with, uh, with single agent uh, or combined agent therapy. And so there's been two recent trials of DMMR therapy in rectal cancer that we've all heard uh, almost way too much about. Um, the first published uh, this year and was at ASCO of a uh, PD-1 agent, Ostalumab. Uh, patients with DMMR rectal cancer were treated with six months of therapy, and then they were re-evaluated 
and this will all happen in Memorial Sloan Kettering, and if they had a clinical complete response, they were offered non-operative uh, management. So uh, total of patients were uh, 30 of them. This is quite an interesting table one in the sense that um, genomically, uh, these, uh, all these uh, um, were BRAF V6, uh, of, of the 18 patients they uh, published on, all of them were B600E wild type, even though half of them uh, we were uh, told we had no uh, documented um, uh, no documented lynch. So there's going to, there's definitely some digging into, into this question. You know, who were these patients? Were, were they all lynch or, or does this have broader applicability? And so, and this is the, uh, the slide they presented. And I think, you know, two things to note, um, the medium follow-up is still very short and um, it does, you know, it did take a while for them uh, um, to, to document a, a complete clinical response in, in some of these patients. The second DMMR trial that uh, we heard a lot about and many of us are participating in has been affected by the distalimab results. Uh, it, um, it is being revised and overall this concept was different in that it used dual PD, uh, PDL1 uh, and CTLA4 therapy. So, uh, you know, hitting them a little harder with immunotherapy. And whereas previously they were going to give trimodality therapy, that was how the protocol was built for these patients, um, that's now uh, been modified and it's not yet approved, but um, to, you know, load up with immunotherapy for a total of four months. Uh, or sorry, three months uh, in advance, and, and then doing the disease assessment, and then deferring radiation unto, um, unless there is a, a residual disease. And so, so I think that's a, a nice reflection of how the distalimab results have have changed our understanding of this disease. I think I, you know, I, I think the you know DMMR rectal cancer is a rare disease. I don't know how many, Smith, I don't know how many you've seen, but- um, 3% in ours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I, I can count on one hand and, and you know, how many rectal cancer DMMRs I, I've seen. Um, and so, and this is you know, like, you, this is known, right? I mean, this is TCGA in 2012. It told us that the hypermutated tumors are predominantly concentrated on the right. And that's the, the red, uh, that you can see. So the, the big dif the big difference between genomically between uh, left and right uh, uh, is uh, is seen uh, and, and is really driven by the hypermutated tumors and uh, hypermutated erectile malignancies that are DMMR is really quite a rare beast. Um, so what do we do now? Um, you know, look, this is really starting to look like we might do single modality therapy, um, maybe because it's so early stage. And, you know, that's why people like Sunita are doing the, the, the studies of, of, of immunotherapy in earlier stage tumors. We have other uh, trials, prospective trials, looking at uh, immunotherapy as showing um, uh, high response rates. And and I think one of the things, we, again, we learned from Memorial Sloan Kettering is you've got to wait and you've got to get, let the immunotherapy uh, do its work. So give it like six months before you make a decision about surgery. So what happens now? What do I do for my DMMR patients? You know, I've put one on pay, uh, Kathy's, uh, on Kristen Kim, uh, Kristen's trial. I, I had another one who wasn't eligible. And I was able to get, you know, uh, uh, company access um, uh, checkpoint inhibitor. And you know what, you know, Nancy, you did a nice uh, st study uh, showing DMMR outcomes, rectal outcomes of patients uh, treated with chemo rads, and and they, they respond nicely to chemo, uh, to chemo rads. You know, they she had a complete uh, thirty percent complete pathologic response. So you know, if all else fails. Don't give them chemo, but we'll give them, you know, chemo radiation. So um, kind of my one of my favorite topics is early rectal cancer. And, you know, with screening, it is a much more common finding. And, and even in early rectal cancer, T uh, radical surgery is still the standard, unless you're very low risk. So this is a really 
this is a really important population for trials, I think. And, and patients, they're like, oh, I have just a T2 tumor. You mean I, I need a bag for that? I mean, what, what, why can't we do that with minimally invasive? And then we know that prior trials have looked at uh, this question, looking at organ sparing therapy um, for this very patient population by giving them induction chemoradiation. And these are the uh, prior studies um, over the last really two decades. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in this uh, topic of stage one to the T3 and zero tumors, giving them induction chemorads and then transanal surgery. And then and, and overall, the organ sparing rate between those trials has been ranging between 52% um, and 68. Fairly consistent results with consistent uh, therapy applied in different trials. That, you mean, in spite of all those, uh, of those trials, you know, the practice has not changed. You know, there was actually a really, Dr. Stitzenberg, who's a colorectal surgeon at Duke did a really nice analysis of you know, what's the use of radiation for T2 tumors and actually started has de been declining over, over the years, not increasing. So surgery remains a standard. Um, so there's been, uh, again, there's uh, ongoing studies to look at you know, ways to um, improve uh, organ sparing for stage uh, one. And this is a, a Danish uh, initiative that was a published single arm study of dose escalated um, chemo radiation going up to 62 gray treated to the tumor and then following um, allowing watch and wait if they had a complete clinical response presented this year at ASCO. And, and overall, uh, one of the early endpoints has been looking at the organ sparing rate, which uh, has been sitting around 61% at the two-year level. And we'll see um, uh, further results on function in the future. That uh, one of the discussants of the study you know, really did point out that um, you know, we we need we need to await the results of, of the function um, before really deciding whether we should be rating. Yeah. So, um, Star Trek trial is uh, also a randomized study, and um, and looking at a similar question of uh, T one to T three patients randomized to either radical surgery or. Um, uh, radiation in the short course or chemo rads. And, and really, that's really what's going to be needed to change practice, isn't it? It is a randomized tri trial versus surgery. Um, and uh, the overall result, and this is really what they saw. They did a two-stage assessment, really reflecting that you need to give the radiation time to work. And uh, they gave it uh, uh, the initial first look after completion of radiation or chemo radiation was after three months or up to even um, uh, five months. And uh, and uh, and then their prime one of their endpoints was organ sparing, which was 50, uh, 59 percent. So again, uh, we published our trial this this um, uh, this year, looking at organ sparing therapy with three months of induction chemo a non-radiation um, therapy approach um, just with chemo. And um, we saw some really nice responses uh, after three months of chemotherapy with nice tumor regression, which is you know obviously what you wanna see. And, um, and I think one of the, this is an important slide and because there's a lot of questions, well, why are you even doing a, a uh, transanal surgery if you have nice endoscopic evidence of regression. And the reason really is, is that you can have a T2 or T3 tumor uh, with tumor deposits sitting deeper underneath, uh, underneath the mucosa um, uh, easily. And that happened in, in a number of patients. So, so that's really why we argue for doing transanal surgery and not just watch and wait. So, so that is really um, how uh, our results panned out. Uh, we, we looked at functional status and it was very good for the majority. Uh, hardly any patients had any change in their LARS. So this is comparing LARS of any grade pre-op versus, uh, sorry, uh, at baseline versus 12 months after the completion of chemo and um, a transanal surgery. And when you compare 
these outcomes, the, we see much better outcomes in our cohort, obviously cross trial comparison than we do in patients that have pelvic radiation uh, and organ sparing or even radical surgery. So, so really um, we presented this yesterday. Um, it's, we put this forward this week to the GI steering committee, uh, uh, the concept of taking patients with um, early stage rectal cancer, same population, induction chemo, transanal surgery, and then randomizing them to either observation or radiation if they had residual disease. And if they didn't have residual disease, they're really going to do well, and we didn't think they should be radiated. Uh, and that during the observation period, we of course we had to we did want to do a, a, a so a looking at a, the role of ctDNA in this early setting. And that is um, uh, uh, that's the subject of the second randomization. So really, the state of the art for early rectal cancer, lots of interest in organ sparing. A lot, most of those trials have come from uh, Europe, and um, it looks like so far we might achieve a uh, 60% organ sparing rate. Um, maybe we need a, a more modalities to increase this, and maybe hopefully we'll have a, a North American in initiative soon. Um, finally, a quick word on uh, chemotherapy and to try to use uh, uh, de-escalate or escalate chemotherapy with a very important new development of CTDNA. And, you know, I titled this slide stage MRD because it really is a critical way. It's, it, AJCC does not yet reflect this, but I think all of, all of this staging is going to change. Uh, and to, it, it needs to, to incorporate uh, MRD, and, and particularly in CRC, which is the most advanced in using this concept. And MRD positive really is a state of the presence of cancer uh, um, after surgical, um, that should be uh, resection, not detection, or other definitive procedure in the absence of radiographic disease. So this is kind of uh, where it sits. And, um, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, you know, you 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 you, you treated the patients and you did the surgery, and then you we see them in clinic, and and we don't know where they are. You know, they 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 could be in any one of those three cat three categories: detectable ctDNA, undetectable by ctDNA. It's going to come back or cured, and that's what the uh, ctDNA assay does it, it, it helps risk stratify them and the reason i believe this is, is is so critical that we incorporate that into staging is that it blows all the pathologic um, risk factors out of the water in a multivariate analysis so the hazard ratio of uh, four week post op ct dna positivity is, is 15% and compare that to node positive versus negative i mean it it it, it kind of flattened out the node positive versus negative uh, argument um braf interestingly um factored in there so so that's really what's happening here with ct dna um and, and of course there's tumor informed versus non tumor informed the tumor informed just uses somatic mutations that we need to find using the archival diagnostic specimen. And the non tumor informed, which are a little bit more convenient because we can get them in two weeks instead of, you know, it's actually six weeks. My Noteras are coming back in six weeks. They use somatic mutations that are not compatible with life and the presence of methylation and fragmentomics in the blood. And, and these are the assays. There's, there's going to be so many coming. It is unbelievable. We're seeing a storm of data. We're seeing a, a, a tsunami wave of companies entering this market, and it's going to be pretty overwhelming knowing what to choose and for what patients. But overall, you know, the two big ones right now are the Garden and the Signatera. And in, in this year, I'm just about finished. Um, you know, we had our first, you know, we all this data, you know, we now have CTDNA is actually funded. And not only does it have a label, but it's funded for stage two, three rectal cancer and colon cancer in the MRD setting. All of that data was based on non-randomized uh, evidence. And this, um, now we're starting to see the first um, ev randomized evidence of how ctDNA can actually affect management. And the first study of that was um, presented by Jeannie Tai uh, at uh, ASCO this year that looked at the question of 
a stage two colon cancer where there's some really good equipoise about the value of chemotherapy. And a simple question, practical question of assigning patients in a two to one manner with stage two post-operative MRD setting uh, to standard management, you know, investigator choice chemo versus uh, only chemo if they are CTDNA positive and no chemo if they were CTDN negative. And the primary endpoint is a nice standard uh, endpoint of relapse free survival. So overall, the results indicated that CTDNA management it confirmed um, was uh, to be non-inferior to using standard path uh, markers um, by the RFS endpoint. And the other thing I'll point out is that 15% of patients in that study were MRD positive. So we know these patients, some of them do relapse. Uh, we know that. We just don't know who they are. And I think this is, is going to make the difference. And so, so all kinds of other trials, you know, the, the, in North America, we're a wee bit behind, you know, the, the Europeans are a little bit ahead on this data and the Australian doctors, Ty uh, is from Australia, but we are doing a similar trial in colon cancer, looking at tumor uh, uh, CTDNA informed management uh, in stage two cancer, and then CTDNA informed uh, management of stage three colorectal cancer. So one last slide of, of uh, specifically randomized CTDNA trials in rectal cancer. And one thing I'd like you to notice is oh, they're all really in the setting of post-op therapy. So they already they're a wee bit outdated because they uh, you know, the field has changed to pre-op therapy. So we know, you know, Stacey Cohen was really trying to, trying to integrate CTDNA in, in a pre-op management of pre-op therapy in the TNT era. Um, that didn't go through, but I think we're going to get something through at some point. Uh, so um, um, I think that I put the slide up because we did CTDNA in our NEO trial. And the one thing we noticed is that in patients that had their tumor in place, we looked at the ability of the CTDNA assay to detect the tumor in the blood. And the sensitivity was actually quite low for T1 tumors of 30, uh, 33%. For T tumors, it was 41%. And for T3 tumors, it was 73 So this is the Achilles heel of CTDNA is the sensitivity. And that's what we're going to be working on. And so where I think we're going to see some limitations of the CTDNA, and it may be in the early stage setting. So overall, um, you know, obviously trimodality therapy has improved our outcomes. Toxicity is an issue, especially particularly if you combine surgery and radiation. There's lots of interest in bimodality therapy and organ sparing therapy. We need novel systemic therapies because patients are still relapsing. And I think CTDNA is really, you know, we're going to be talking about that a lot. All right. Any questions? <laughs> well, Hagen, that was that was amazing. That was a tour de force yeah. review of rectal cancer. Uh, any questions from the group? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was just fantastic, Hagen. Thank you so much. I was just curious, what was the CTDNA assay you used in Neo? We used. Um, we partnered with Foundation, and they don't have a, a marketed assay yet. They actually didn't want us to publish the results. We're going to publish them because they're like, oh, that doesn't look very good. I'm like, well, shouldn't that help? The you own the data. <laughs> so, yeah. Three quick questions. Yeah. Rapid fire. Yeah. Long versus short course radiation. Yeah. Do we know what's going to just be the standard? Well, I think it's going to be, you know, still long. It's the default. Okay. Yeah. How about management of watch and wait with stage four disease to deliver? Yeah. More complicated. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the liver drives the prognosis. And I think we're, that's the other thing that this the watch and wait has done. It's, it's given the surgeons and med onks much more comfort in like letting the rectal beast, you know, watching it yeah. while we deal with the more important things in the liver. And are we going to get to uh, CCR and colon and avoid surgery? Similar paradigm with pre op yeah. therapy. Well, Smith is going to do that program. for us. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> All right. Well, our next speaker um, was slated to be virtual, but we actually, ah, okay, is in person. 
Um, and it's going to be Dr. Maggie Sentel from uh, University of California, Irvine. And she'll be talking to us about the poetic uh, trial. Thank you. And um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. And um, I want to acknowledge the opportunity to present again um, at this meeting. And I'm so happy um, that Dr. Smith, Dr. Krishnamurti is also here today. And um, we have been working on this, as I mentioned, for a couple of years now. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to give you some exciting updates. And you know, I think we are moving along um, better than we had hoped for. So um, next slide, please. Or I can move it. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. Um, uh, I think the most important um, concept when it comes to microsatellite stable colon cancer is a recognition that not all microsatellite stable colon cancers are the same. There is a, sub, there is a subset of microsatellite um, stable colon cancers that have a high density of CD3 and CD8 um, lymphocyte infiltration in the tumor core as well as the invasive margin. Now, this is what we measure as immunoscore, and um, there is a Clearly, about more than 20% of microsatellite stable colon cancers have high immunoscore. Now, what we know about immunoscore is that immunoscore is a strong predictor of recurrence, disease-free survival, and overall survival independent of the microsatellite status. So as seen in the graph here, if you, if you look at oh, sorry, the um, MSI, High or low, depending upon the immunoscore, which is the top uh, top lines have high immunoscore and they do have better disease-free survival compared to the patients who have low immunoscore. And so it is important to recognize this very um, different subsets of microsatellite stable patients. Now, as we look at, you know, what is the role of immunotherapy in MMR proficient tumors? And the data comes from a couple of clinical trials. Uh, one is the NISH 1 and 2, the latest update being presented in ASCO 2022. Now, the NISH study included both MMR proficient and MMR deficient tumors, and the patients received ipilimumab one milligram on day one, along with nivolumab three milligram per kilogram meter squared um, on day one and day 15. And what uh, they reported is that in MMR proficient um, colon cancer, seven out of 31 had major pathologic response. That is about 23% of patients. And the major pathologic response was defined as less than 10% viable tumor rest in the surgical specimen. Um, and about four of uh, these patients, about 13%, had a complete pathologic response. And this is just with two doses of ep nebo combination, with just a single dose of CTLA-4 inhibitor and two doses of a PD-1 inhibitor. And that's a remarkable response in MMR proficient tumors. Um, and, and the important finding here what the authors reported is that the main immunological marker that was predictive of response in patients with MMR proficient tumor is the infiltration of the tumor with both lymphocytes that co-express CD8 as well as PD-1. And I think that's an important finding. And any other um, immune uh, marker um, was not predictive. This is the most predictive in the niche study. The Nicole study used nivolumab as, uh, just as a single agent on um, weeks four weeks and two weeks prior to surgical resection. And they also showed um, that in two patients, there was one pathologic response, another one is almost like a 90% regression. So response to immunotherapy in microsatellite stable or MMR proficient tumors is seen and in is seen in as high as 23% of patients. Again, goes with the high immunoscore report that we have seen. So more than 20% of microsatellite stable tumors have high immunoscore and the likelihood of pathologic response in the niche study is more than 20% as well. Um, so we are seeing some similarities here. Now, the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in colon cancer has already been examined. And the reason for this evaluation is that we still continue to struggle with poor disease-free survival in patients with this high-risk colon cancer, meaning the T4 and the node-positive colon cancer. The Foxtrot study, um, the updates have been presented uh, also, randomized patients with T3, um, T4, N0 to N2, M0 colon cancer to upfront surgical resection followed by Falfox chemotherapy, which is the standard, um, standard of care, uh, compared to the experimental group in which patients received six weeks of Falfox, which is about three cycles of Falfox, followed by surgical resection, another um, chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy. The key findings of Foxtrot study is that this preoperative regimen did not increase perioperative complications. 
um, which is important. And there is also decreased risk of undergoing surgery without achieving R0 resection, meaning um, the, the patients who received preoperative chemotherapy had more complete R0 resections, and that, those numbers are shown there. Um, and the primary endpoint, which is the recurrence-free survival, if you look at it on the bottom graph, patients who received preoperative chemotherapy had better um, our improvement in the recurrence-free survival uh, with a relative risk of 0.72. Now, in the Fox chart also gave us an additional piece of information in that the response or the tumor regression score was a strong surrogate marker for long-term oncologic outcomes. What they graded the response into five groups, and based on the five groups, they also mapped out the recurrence events or the percentage who have recurred. And um, what we see here is the bottom, the blue and reds are the ones that had marked or complete response. And those are the group of patients who had the lowest recurrence. And the black line, which is the top line, had no response at the highest recurrence. So the tumor regression score is a very strong surrogate marker for long-term oncological outcomes. Now, putting this all together, we also looked at some of the evidence that is currently available, both in animal models as well as in humans. What is what happens with chemotherapy in the tumors itself? So the main finding is when patients receive chemotherapy, there is a change in tumor immune microenvironment. Um, two things happen. One is there is infiltration of T lymphocytes that are both, again, co-expressing CD8 as well as PD-1 but it also results in an interferon gamma release and also stimulation of the pdl one expression at the tumor level. So this is the adaptive immune resistance that may happen with chemotherapy in the tumor immune microenvironment, but also presents an opportunity for exploitation because adding an immune checkpoint inhibition at this point will allow for the infiltrated tumors, uh, lymphocytes in the tumor to actually act against the tumor. So that is an important um, thing. And we also know that that's the um, uh, observation that was seen in niche study is the infiltration of the co-expressing T lymphocytes with CD8 and PD-1. So overall, the rationale for combining very soon. So that study is being completed because we want to go in this into the study with the best information possible. Um, so, um, you know, the, the statistical analysis, I'll just um, focus on the patients that are needed, about 67 patients per arm, um, enrolling about 147. And how we came to that 67 per arm is based on the fact that the, um, the primary endpoint is going to be tumor regression score. And we would like to focus on TRS 0 and 1, and the combination therapy is expected to have an, um, a complete response in about 25% of the patients, based on the data from NISH as well as the Fox trot. The secondary endpoints is event-free survival, as shown in the bottom, recurrence, death, R1, R2 resections, and not proceeding to surgery. The, uh, the exciting updates, as I had mentioned, is that, uh, you know, uh, we did a, uh, this presentation was given to the NCA colon task force. The subsequent survey was extraordinarily positive. Um, they thought that this trial is absolutely feasible and could be proceeding as proposed uh, with the randomization schema that we had presented. Um, and also, uh, we now have confirmation from BMS um, that they will be willing to support the study and provide the agents for the study. And then the study was also presented at the imaging uh, committee yesterday, and they confirmed that um, a central review of CT scan to confirm staging can be performed within three days. So that will also allow us for randomization of the patients appropriately. And um, that concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Sento? I have one question. Will you have a centralized radiology built in? I think that will be really yes. important in terms of quality control. Yes, and uh, that was the presentation yesterday, and Dr. Tony Shields said that, you know, they, it is feasible to have a centralized review, and, uh, and that review could be completed within three days of them receiving the images. It's an exciting study. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So you're putting in a lot of safeguards to make sure you're not uh, treating a, a low-risk population. Why not treat with three months of chemo? I mean, we know that the chemo is safe. It, it is not harmful. And you know, I th the reason I ask is, it's um, you know, it's harder to talk to patients about uh, you know, 
doing chemo before and after then say hey we do this it's all done yeah. before yeah um, so what are your thoughts I, i'm sure you discussed this extensively <laughs> you know that's a that's a good thought you know uh, one of the things that we um we discussed is that you know how what is the best evidence that we have going into this particular study right um meaning the foxtrot study showed three um three cycles of chemotherapy and that's a pretty strong evidence that we have because our experimental group is that uh, three cycles of fall fox plus the epinevo combination we are not quite sure what the toxicity would be for this combination yet in this subgroup of patients and that's the reason why we wanted to limit the exposure um, to the safest reported uh, data thus far. But it's a good idea. I mean, uh, you know, it's something that we need to explore. Smitha? Any yeah, thoughts? thanks, Hagen. You know, initially the study design was with three months, thinking maybe with three months you could even improve upon the results of Foxtrot. And then, you know, the GI committee, I think there were some concerns about delay, I think actually from the patient advocates about that much pre-op and wanting to get to surgery faster. And then yeah. we spoke with Jenny Seligman of Foxtrot, who I guess, the surgeon she uh, collaborates with feels very strongly about getting the patients to surgery sooner, but we just saw that optical study from China that it's it's feasible and they reported improved survival so I think we don't really know what's the best yeah. answer. And I think that was the main um, kind of sentiment is delaying surgical resection in a resectable group of colon cancer patients. So, um, this in and of itself is a, is a big jump for surgeons to accept that, you know, the patient should go yeah. on chemotherapy. So we wanted to have the best evidence in the most conservative approach, but, you know, great thought. Thank you. Thanks. So we are running a bit behind, uh, so I apologize. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Rachel Safian from um, University of Washington, and she's going to be talking to us about disparities in clinical trial enrollment. Thank you. Can you bring up the disparities slide up uh, on the screen? Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you for thank you for inviting me to speak today. So, for those of you I have not met, I'm Rachel Safian. Um, I'm at Fred Hutch Cancer Center and I'm uh, the DEI lead for the GI uh, committee. So just a little bit of background, uh, equity, diversion, inclusion, and cancer care is not one thing, it's everything. Um, I thought that was a really great title to an ASCO Connection article from earlier this year. Um, and I think it really plays near and dear to all of our hearts about how we can provide the highest quality of care to all of our patients, not just our own, but to all cancer patients. So just a little bit of background, we all know that over the last uh, 30 years, there's been a tremendous improvement in cancer care with a 31% reduction in cancer mortality, but that has not been enjoyed across the board uh, by all individuals. And in particular, black patients have the highest rate of death and the shortest life uh, when it comes to cancer care. And this just highlights across some different GI malignancies that it's across different stages in colorectal, biliary, pancreas cancer, black patients have worse outcomes uh, than white patients. I do want to mention I'm not only focused on black patients, but this particular table um, really highlights that disparity. So disparity, there are a lot of reasons for these disparities. Uh, this article highlighted that it, it is linked uh, to health insurance uh, access. So health insurance coverage is strongly linked to quality of care. Uh, in this particular observation in colorectal cancer patients, patients with private insurance uh, were two times more as likely than uninsured patients to receive either surgical resection for their stage 1, 2 disease or chemotherapy for stage 3. Um, and as illustrated on the right, patients with stage 2 private insurance, the blue dotted line, had a higher five-year survival than patients with stage 1 uninsured, which is the green solid line. Also in rectal cancer uh, treatments, uh, differences in outcomes, but racial disparities, possibly because of the complexity of their care. Um, so just to highlight a couple points, if you look at stage one patients, left being white, uh, right being black patients, the pink line are the patients who go for surgery. So surgical resection is higher in white patients, 35% compared to 20%. Um, in black patients. If you look at stage one patients, again, those who receive no care for their treatment, um, it's 7% if you're black and 3% if you're white. Um, for stage two, three patients, looking at who gets chemo radiation followed by surgical resection, 60% um, of white patients receive multimodality therapy, whereas 57% uh, of black patients. So SWAG has a multi-year initiative. We're all very familiar. Cancer impacts all of us, but clinical trials to improve cancer care do not currently serve all of us equitably. Oops. 
So um, what I want to take us through very briefly today is where, where have we been as a community, where are we now, and where are we going? So the, one of the first question to ask is who enrolls on our clinical trials? Well, we know um, there have been many publications. I thought this is a very nice one uh, by Joe Unger, looking at uh, representation of black patients across SWOG and pharmaceutical sponsored trials. The table on the right illustrates the characteristics of uh, who he was looking at through this uh, systematic review. It's all solid tumor patients, essentially, as well as he malignancies. And what he found reaffirmed what we know, which is that black patients don't enroll um, as um, as highly um, as non as Caucasians on clinical trials as illustrated on the left only 2.9% of pharmaceutical company trials uh, had black patients compared to US cancer patients 12.1% swag does a little better, but we could clearly do much better it's at 9%. Um, and this was seen across tumor types, and this just illustrates on the right, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, um, it's really um, across the board. So what are we doing in the GI committee and would love your involvement as well. Um, so we're planning to look back at a retrospective analysis of this SWOG uh, GI treatment trials. I know there's been a discussion looking at the surgical trials. Um, who enrolls on these studies? So we've been working with Catherine Guthrie's team to identify a data dictionary and we've made significant progress there. Um, we want to look by cancer type, by trial, by the treatment medication patients have received. And some of the elements we want to look at are age, gender, ethnicity, race. Um, we have their um, insurance status, so we can also get at veteran status, um, geographic setting, both the patients and the MD's location. We don't have access to everything. Not everything has been uh, collected um, as part of the of trial, what's in the data dictionary. So that is where we are now with that project. Who goes on to our studies? But then the next question to ask is, well, what are, we clearly know there are going to be barriers. We're not going to get, it's not going to be a good, a good outcome there. So how do we improve uh, clinical trial enrollment? So this is, Joe Unger has a, a lot of papers on this, and it's another really good paper of his published in 2019, which where they looked at it in a systematic and meta-analysis review, uh, the structural framework for how patients go on to study. So walking through the left, you're a cancer patient, you walk into the office, and that's where it initially begins, right? The, the doctor discusses the option of clinical trials. And at that point, they know before they've probably brought it up whether there is a clinical trial available or not. So if there's no trial available, then you leave the algorithm there. It's a structural problem. Um, if there is a clinical trial available, is the patient eligible or not? Um, and the physician often will assess eligibility before discussing the trial. So if the patient's not eligible, they leave the, di the diagram. If the patient's eligible, it's at that point that the discussion often happens with the provider and then the patient declines or accepts to enroll. And what he found was that the majority, so over, just over 75%, 77% of patients do not go on study because of structural and clinical barriers. And just over 50% of patients don't go on because no trial is available. Um, about 21% don't go on because a patient's not ineligible. Of the studies that reported out why patients were not ineligible, performance status was the leader amongst them. Um, and then really the patient physician decision making factors were less common. Um, I do want to highlight that uh, in this particular analysis, they noted that 8% of adult cancer patients enrolled on trials. That's higher than what's typically thought of as like 2 to 3%. Um, and as one might expect, it was almost 16% in academic centers, so higher compared to community enrollment. So what other uh, information do we have out there? So this was a single center experience looking at barriers to cancer clinical trial enrollment done at my past institution at Columbia. Um, this looked at 120 physicians and staff and 150 cancer patients in 2017 and 2018. They surveyed physicians and staff and they interviewed patients. And they were really trying to get at what are the structural barriers uh, that physicians and staff encounter? What are what is everyone's knowledge, attitudes, and belief by ethnicity? And then they compared clinical trial attitudes and reason for participation or declination uh, based on perceptions by physicians, staff, and cancer patients. Um, I wish I could have shown you all the questions that they asked. It's actually very interesting and to read the different responses. Um, in general, three quarters of physicians and staff comment about lack of time in the clinic. There's also notes about um, not being able to remember eligibility criteria and there are a lot of other structural factors um, actually hispanics were more likely to go on study even if there's a standard of care option than non-hispanics um, and then there are other 
physicians thought that patients would not want to go on because of the complexity and the knowledge required to relay it to, to patients. And actually, that was not a high thing that uh, patients <coughs> rated. So um, interestingly enough, though, 61% of patients who were surveyed in this were Caucasian, only 13% uh, were Blacks, 29% Hispanics, and since I worked at Columbia, the de that does not reflect the demographic of that institution, um, which is about two-thirds Hispanic and African American. So there's clearly still, that does reflect the fact that we're not capturing these patients on studies. So what about when we offer a patient a study? Do patients accept? Um, and historically, that's been thought to be about 50%, just over 50%. And Unger found the same thing in this systematic review and meta-analysis that when offered a trial, uh, all comers, when he looked at 30 different studies, 55 patients said yes to a trial. That's actually slightly higher in Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians when you break that down, um, ranging somewhere between 57 to 67% when compared to uh, whites, white patients. So how are we going to evaluate this question? Because um, I think the answer is a prospective evaluation of this in our SWOG studies is still, the jury is still out. So I want to understand why patients in our GI clinical trials say yes or no to the studies. I think a lot of the questions that were asked by the Columbia study is real, or does get at really good uh, questions. Um, and you can imagine looking at things like language barrier, uh, religious background, cultural backgrounds, cost, location of trials. Uh, treatment safety side effects, um, efficacy concerns, are there better alternatives? Um, and then I want to gather data on the physician as well. Not only some of the structural barriers, but also who are these physicians who are, the, who are offering these studies? What year out of practice are they? What's their ethnicity, gender, et cetera? So the last point that I want to focus on now is just our eligibility criteria. Clearly, a, one of the major factors is to our enrollment. Um, this is just to highlight that there that race has, there's been this idea of race medicine, right? There's EGFR, there's drugs that have been looked at that have had better outcomes like heart failure medications in black patients um, and really moving away from that. Um, we, there aren't many of those in oncologic trials, but certainly in oncology, there are risk assessment scores that do take into, into account race. So moving away from things like that. Um, ASCO, Friends of Cancer Research, the FDA have pushed forward into looking at modern eligibility criteria. Specifically, they looked at performance status and really saying that we don't have to be so stringent with zero performance status of zero to one or a KPS of uh, 80 to 100, that we should really be expanding that to provide more real world data. So what are our plans? So in order to look at uh, eligibility criteria, we're looking to incorporate a DEI rating form into clinical trial development um, as it goes through the process through SWOG. And that will capture not only can we expand eligibility criteria to increase minority enrollment in looking very closely at each bullet point, but also where will the study open? Um, can we capture more patients away from academic hubs, the VA uh, community locations? And of course, are there any race-based algorithms in our eligibility? So in the future, we're going to build upon this. I would love to brainstorm with anyone who is interested. Um, I know that I work very closely with Colmar Figueroa Mosley, who is the DEI champion for the, DEI, for the GI group. And he and I have a few additional ideas that will require some grant funding. So that's part of our efforts. Um, and of course, working with the leadership. So my last slide is just that this really is a group effort. Um, and I think we all do have to take action in order to address underrepresentation in cancer research. Thank you, that was fantastic. Oh, any questions? No, that's great, Rachel. Um, what about language? Obviously, they race and language sometimes go hand in hand, and you know, consenting patients in different languages, uh, translator translators versus a, a translated consent. Any understanding of to what extent that uh, presents a barrier, and what the optimal way is to consent patients like this in different language? So that did come up in. That was asked in the Columbia study, in that single center study. Um, about a quarter of the patients on the study were Spanish speaking, and one of the questions on of the 150 patients, and one of the questions that was asked to physicians and staff was, um, "Is getting a translated ICF a, bar a barrier?" Mm -hmm. And about I don't remember the exact number, it was about 40 percent or so said yes. Um, again, single center study, and I didn't comment on how to overcome that, but I think it is a really important point um, when we think about that. Do you have any guidance? Get a, is it better to get a translated consent or just get the translator in there and translate I, it word for word? My, I, and, 
So I don't know what the data. I, so in my yeah. opinion, it would be both because I think the I think the patient, just like we have to say, the patient adequately had opportunity to read it. They have to be able to read it, but at the same time, we have to be able to at least discuss it and inform someone. So which will also require an interpreter. Uh, just last question: yeah. If someone on the surgery committee wants to work with you, should they just reach out to you directly? That would be fantastic. Great. Thank you. We're going to move along again. Uh, I apologize, we're running late. Uh, Devendra, are you on? Hi, uh, yes. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you say something? Can you hear me? No. no? I can't hear him. Yeah. Um, I am. Speaking. Are you guys working on it back there? Yes. Yeah, Devendra? I'm speaking. No. <coughs> no luck. All right. We're going to go to the next. Uh, talk a bit, we'll work on it. All right. Okay. So, uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Josh Mabin. Um, It's a international trial, Melmart, uh, but uh, here in the United States, it's run through SWOG, it's uh, 2015. And you all have heard about this talk uh, uh, several times, but this is the first time that I'm presenting once we started actually accruing patients. Uh, so it's kind of exciting. So this is about as pure of a surgical trial as it gets. I mean, it is two surgical, very much a surgical question, which is what are the appropriate margins for uh, early stage melanoma? Now that seems like, uh, for those of you who don't do melanoma, that seems like a kind of a silly question to ask. Didn't we already learn that? Or one centimeter, two centimeters? Well, we actually really don't know. Uh, and the real proof of that is the fact that their international guidelines actually vary pretty substantially, anywhere from three centimeter margins to one centimeter margins for thicker melanomas. Uh, so that's really asking the question of, could we be a little bit more conservative and do a one centimeter margin in the pretty much every uh, early stage melanoma? Uh, the, this trial had actually already had a pilot or kind of a feasibility version uh, already performed uh, in 2015 to 2016. It was actually presented here at SWOG uh, as a proposal way back when, uh, but uh, we, we didn't enroll on that trial as a group. Uh, but they did uh, randomize 400 participants, uh, and it didn't, wasn't uh, power to answer the question. It was really a, a feasibility trial. Uh, but it did have some interesting findings, uh, not surprisingly, uh, patients that had two centimeter margins re required reconstruction more often than those who had a one centimeter margin. So again, not a very surprising finding, but it really did show that you could enroll patients in a, a trial like this. Uh, so the uh, endpoints are fairly um, predictable. Uh, Disease-free survival is the uh, primary endpoint, and there are a variety of secondary endpoints, and I do need to point out uh, that even though the larger trial has uh, the secondary endpoints uh, in the United States, we have not had some, several of the PRO uh, components uh, activated as of yet. Still working on that. So the schema, again, is really, really simple. It's for adults uh, with uh, stage two uh, melanomas. Uh, there are some stratification criteria. And these stratifications, I think, are really quite important, particularly stratification by country, uh, because the adjuvant treatments for stage two melanomas vary by country. So I'm really glad that uh, we have that stratification criteria there. Uh, and again, it's the margins are one centimeter versus uh, two centimeter. Uh, these are the eligibility criteria. Again, this is very uh, straightforward eligibility criteria. These adults with stage two melanomas, you have to be able to do a two centimeter margin if you're enrolling a patient in this trial. Uh, so it's so we don't uh, inappropriately um, have uh, patients who are uh, only a one centimeter margin was possible, and they do need to have a life expectancy of at least five years. And these are the exclusion criteria. Uh, standard of care is, is expected on all these patients, particularly being able to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, so uh, if that's not possible, uh, they're not eligible for this trial. Uh, the follow-up is for five years is mandatory, but up to 10 year follow-up is allowed because some of these recurrences are going to be uh, later. Uh, and um, again, looking for recurrences or, or disease-free survival, really an examination is quite important. In addition to uh, uh, the actual uh, endpoint of recurrence, looking at uh, outcomes from uh, complication or event, um, events from surgery are also uh, closely monitored. 
the expectation, as you may imagine, is that a larger margin might lead to more complications. Again, we don't really know that, but that is the kind of the expectation. Uh, and so that's why uh, these are looked at very closely for the first uh, 90 days. And I, I, we review them as a group, uh, making sure that we identify all of these complications. And it's not just complications at the site of the vital precision, it's actually at the central lymph node site, the site as well, or complications like UTIs, pneumonias, things like that. I lost the ability to click, I think. All right, thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, not all, unfortunately, the PROs are not yet uh, open yet. I'm still working on that. When we opened the trial, um, uh, there was a lot of uh, challenges with trying to uh, open an international trial. Uh, their database is different than ours. We had to open REDCap. They had to create this open node. A lot of IT stuff that I didn't understand and still don't fully understand. Uh, so we opened the bare bones version of this trial, which is really kind of the, the randomization. So the PROs are not open yet. I'm in contact with CTAP and we're working on getting the PROs, which I think are incredibly important. I mean, do they have more pain after a two centimeter margin? What do they think about the cosmetic outcomes? Things of that nature, I think would be really important. And we're hoping to have that open as well. There's also a translational component that I'm working on. Actually, just yesterday, I got the letter from the Australian group, a uh, letter of support that we're gonna submit to CTAP to open a translational component. So hopefully that'll be a translational uh, component for this trial as well. So uh, activated actually at the uh, SWOG meeting uh, the last time we went in Seattle. So uh, now there are more than 40 sites open. Uh, if you look in the, uh, in the program book, it says that we've accrued eight patients. Well, as you can tell, we, that was uh, printed in you know, a couple months ago. Now we have 31 subjects that are enrolled in this trial. So it's, it's really quite exciting, the number of uh, subjects that are enrolling. This looks like the uh, actual versus the uh, anticipated. As you can see, we're below what we had initially anticipated, but that curve is, that rate of increase is pretty substantial now. And uh, as I said in the melanoma meeting, it's not that we're competitive, but we're competitive. Uh, our uh, annual target was 180. We blew that out of the water already with 188 subjects accrued in the United States. So that's United States accrual. But Great Britain accrued 109 this year. So we're a little bit lower uh, than Great Britain for today, this annual accrual. But sites are coming on all the time. Uh, so I, I'm expecting that the US uh, will continue to be the largest accruing uh, uh, country uh, for this trial. Uh, and these are the uh, sites in the United States. There were six uh, sites in the United States that had started accruing to this trial prior to SWOG activating. Uh, so those are the high accruing sites, expect, except for Spectrum Health, which has opened the trial just in June, and they're already on the map there having accrued uh, 16 subjects. So just very, very impressive. Uh, so there's a lot of enthusiasm for this trial. Uh, so I'm excited by our, our rate of uh, accrual. Uh, so um, these are uh, the, all the individuals I need to thank uh, and uh, uh, really excited that we got this trial up and running and uh, appreciate the, this committee support uh, throughout uh, the last couple of years. Great. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Dr. Sonja, Dr. Sussman, any comments? Great. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Yep. All right. Can we see if Dr. Sohal uh, is available now? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can. Can we get the volume up a little bit? Can you hear me now? Can Sorry, you see my slides? Go ahead. You can see my slides, right? Yes, we can. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm Devinder Sohal. I do Medonk at U Cincinnati. I have the good fortune of working with Siamad for several years. This is our work. Uh, this is a platform trial with total neoadjuvant therapy, uh, TNT in pancreatic cancer. Why not us in pancreas, right? <laughs> so this is the background, 1505. We did this in SWOG, started seven years ago, finished a couple of years ago and published this. This was the first co-op group study for perioperative chemotherapy for resectable disease. Obviously, I don't need to tell this audience that surgery first has always been the approach in pancreas cancer. And these were the results. Uh, Fulfirinox and Gemna Paclitaxel were identical. 73% of patients were resected. Neoadjuvant was completed in a large majority, 85% was, but only about 45% could complete adjuvant chemotherapy. So 
the lessons learned were that we should give everything up front as much as we can. We need to add novel agents because the overall survival was still barely two years in this deadly disease. And we picked Fulfirnox as the backbone because the totality of data in pancreatic cancer still remains in favor of Fulfirnox. Uh, Gemna paclitaxel, as you know, did not pan out in the adjuvant setting. So its role in a curative disease settings is uh, probably slightly less than Fulfirnox. So here's our current design. Patients will be randomized to the control arm of Fulfirinox. They get it for six months or however much. We will build in dose modifications, but we will stop the chemotherapy when they reach about 75% of planned dose. If they cannot take any more, we will take them to surgery. The first experimental arm, and I'll go through these, is IL-1 RAP. The second one is PD-1 CXCR4. The third one is Netrin. This is a randomized phase two design. We will include resectable and borderline resectable patients. The primary outcome is time to treatment failure. Catherine Guthrie has worked on these stats. Time to treatment failure will be defined as basically failure to achieve a cure. Death, obviously, progression during neoadjuvant therapy, recurrence after surgery, intraop findings of metastatic disease, et cetera. And we aim to go from one year based on 1505 and the Alliance Borderline study put together to one and a half years for time to treatment failure. We want to be aggressive and that will require 68 patients per arm. Please note that the experimental arms are being compared individually against the control arm. This is not a contest of one novel agent versus the other. Obviously, drug companies will not... Uh, agree to that idea and becomes it also becomes statistically very cumbersome. So everything is being con compared individually against the control arm. We've learned our lessons and we will build baseline scan reviews to make sure that patients have resectable or borderline disease and not beyond that. We'll build in tissue and blood-based biomarkers. This is the first experimental arm. IL-1 alpha is released by tumor cells. IL-1 beta is released by stromal cells. They are both immunosuppressive, essentially. And the IL-1 receptor accessory protein, IL-1 RAP, antibody made by Contargia, a company in Sweden, blocks that axis and essentially acts as an immunostimulatory drug by suppressing the immune suppressive signals, negative of negative. This is their study in metastatic disease, gemcitamine, napaclitaxel, plus nadonolimab. Uh, they had two dose levels, and the take-home point is overall response rate of 33%. If you go back to the historical control of gemnapaclitaxel, that was 9%. The median overall survival here is 12.7 months in the second to last row. The historical control was 8.7 months. So we think this is effective. And obviously, the, the data accumulating in multiple GI cancers is that immunotherapy works better in earlier diseases, earlier stages. Um, in the metastatic disease, the immune system is already overwhelmed, especially with liver metastases, and therefore bringing these drugs up front probably will provide more bang for the buck. This is Venu Pillary Sari's work, a surgical oncologist at U Washington. He's worked on CXCR4, which is a molecule that leads to T cell suppression. So blocking CXCR4 releases T cells and then adding PD-1 stimulates them. So again, this is immunostimulatory effect. This was tested in metastatic disease as well and the median overall survival and the second line was 6.5 months compared with the historical control of 5-FU nanoliposomal erinotecan this is promising. Again, the same idea, bringing it up front will probably provide more, uh, more uh, proportional benefit. This is the third arm. This is Darren Carpizo's work and other surgical oncologists at University of Rochester. 
I cannot understand how you can work in the OR and in the lab, but you guys do it. This is fascinating work. This is based on Netrin-1. Uh, this is an axonal guidance molecule, which leads to embryonic development and basically leads to cell migration in pancreatic cancer that leads to metastatic disease. Uh, in, the, uh, in the cancer uh, um, paradigm, it works on deleted and colorectal cancer and ANC5B molecules, which are essentially ligand independent functionals, uh, and they can lead to cancer cell progression, especially metastases. So again, blocking this, this is a drug by Netris Pharma can hopefully control, uh, hopefully prevent the development of metastases in early disease. This has been tested in gynon cancers, and we now have safety data of this molecule with chemotherapy. As you can see here, carboplatin plus paclitaxel plus the netrin drug led to no dose-limiting toxicities, no DLTs, and there's an ongoing trial with fulfirinox in locally advanced pancreas cancer in France. Hopefully by this time our study is ready to accrue, we will have safety data in this uh, with this molecule as well. So that's the summary. Uh, this is the current status. The big, obviously, barrier is getting these drugs. Contargia has committed for IL-1 RAP. CXCR4, Bioline RX is on board. Uh, Netrin-1 is on, Netris is on board. We are talking to companies with PD-1. Getting a PD-1 is a little difficult these days because they're running out of their patent lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, pancreas, obviously, Traditionally, companies have not been very interested. So hopefully we can put it all together and get going in over the next few months, get these companies to uh, agree to uh, provide their support. So that's the model here. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Thank sorry you. I could not be in person this time. Thank you, Devendra. Any questions for Dr. Sohal? All right. Thank you, Devendra. So Thank you. Changing the schedule, the last speaker is uh, Dr. Vernon Sondak, who's the chair of uh, cutaneous oncology, chair of the Department of Cutaneous Oncology at Moffitt. He'll be talking to us about uh, SWOG trials 15, 12, and 1801. Thank you. We've heard a lot about neoadjuvant therapy, and uh, in melanoma, we've certainly embraced this. Uh, quite a bit, but the data on it has been uh, challenged by many people and mostly by the many different surgeons who take care of melanoma and other cutaneous malignancies, um, which can occur anywhere in the body. So we have ENT surgeons, plastic surgeons, surgical oncologists, etc. The penetration of neoadjuvant therapy has certainly been variable. Um, so uh, these are my disclosures. At the same time, there's been no denying that the revolution in the systemic therapy of melanoma has changed virtually everything about the disease. The median survival with modern treatment is more than three years versus seven to eight months when I started as the chair of the um, uh, melanoma committee in the 1990s. And at that time in the 1990s, the 25% of people with stage four disease were still alive at one year, most of them in hospice, most of them having been on treatment only a month or two before they progressed. Now, 60% of patients on this clinical trial done more than six years ago of Ipi Nevo versus Nevo versus Ipi. 60% of the patients with a BRAF mutation randomized to Nevo and ipilimumab were still alive five years later. This is just an extraordinary uh, transition. And even 46% of the patients getting single agent nivolumab were still alive five years later. They also had a BRAF mutation. So now the question is no longer what do we do for our patients with melanoma, but what do we do first. Um, and this is a patient with very advanced, um, but technically resectable regional disease, 
and clearly a patient for whom upfront therapy is appropriate. In this case, the patient had a BRAF mutation. Do we do immunotherapy? Do we do uh, targeted therapy? But we've even moved from these obvious, a case like that with such extensive disease, any surgeon would say, what can you do to help us treat this? Now we're at, even into the stage two clinically localized disease. This is a locally advanced desmoplastic melanoma of the scalp. The desmoplastic melanoma is not this black spot, that's the scar of the biopsy. This ill-defined um, uh, hypervascular lesion is the desmoplastic melanoma, and resecting that with negative margins would take a large uh, skin graft and postoperative radiation. So we're exploring the whole gamut of what can be done with neoadjuvant therapy. In our um, disease process, there are a lot of potential advantages of neoadjuvant therapy. Um, and especially with immunotherapy, you can make the strong argument that having tumor antigens present during the treatment um, and giving the treatment before any putative immunosuppressive state of surgery is important. We've always focused on the ability to assess the treatment. The, the fact that when neoadjuvant therapy, we see the patients responding. Uh, and of course, the earlier treatment of subclinical disease. So it was reasonable to ask the question that no one has ever really asked in a very compelling fashion. Are these advantages really enough to make neoadjuvant therapy not just an alternative to adjuvant therapy, but better than adjuvant therapy. There are other benefits that would make it a good idea, but not necessarily better, such as identifying people whose tumor was going to be progressing anyway and couldn't benefit from the surgery. Uh, and of course, making the surgery a little easier. All those things would be good, but they wouldn't necessarily lead to a better ultimate outcome. On the other hand, there are many undesirable events that could happen if you give up front therapy, including delaying or even preventing the ability to do surgery or losing the window to have uh, surgery. And there was still no proven survival benefit for neoadjuvant therapy. Well, this trial has been very, very influential. It was just pre presented. Uh, in Europe a couple of weeks ago. It's a very straightforward study scheme. We took patients with resectable stage three or a few with resectable stage four disease, all of whom would have gotten a standard treatment resection and a year of adjuvant pembrolizumab. And we randomized half of them to the exact same surgery, the exact same treatment, just three doses prior to surgery. That's the only difference, plus the difference in, of course, that you have to restage them with another CAT scan prior to doing the surgery after three cycles of therapy. But essentially, the only difference is when they got three doses of pembrolizumab, uh, not our most effective systemic therapy, but an effective systemic and an effective adjuvant therapy that's been proven to be highly uh, useful and better than adjuvant ipilimumab. Now, in this study, we looked at all the events that could occur. As I said, there are, there are things that could happen that were not just, um, no, no. sorry, let's go see if we can get that back. There are things that could happen that weren't just disease events, they were treatment related events that could happen. So the events included progression or toxicity during the neoadjuvant arm that rendered the patient unable to receive surgery. They also looked at events on the adjuvant arm if you had complications of your surgery so you couldn't get adjuvant therapy or you never got a successful resection to get um, adjuvant therapy. And then the more standard disease recurrence and death events. Now, because events could happen at different times and there was a requirement on the adjuvant arm to start adjuvant therapy within 84 days after surgery, 
Whereas on the neoadjuvant arm, you had a long time before patients had surgery and the patients had uh, started their post-operative adjuvant therapy. We did have to normalize the results. And we essentially said, the clock really starts with surgery. There's all the events that are before surgery, and then we'll put a, we'll call those all happening by day 84 and everything else after the start of uh, adjuvant therapy is where really the clock starts on how we define uh, the time to event. We um, really were out in some uncharted territory when doing the statistics for this study, okay? We knew what to expect from adjuvant therapy, but we also knew that every adjuvant therapy trial excluded a lot of the patients that were in this study. If you couldn't have a successful operation, if you had complications of your surgery and you couldn't start adjuvant therapy, or if your tumor recurred within months after your surgery, you never got on a SWOG adjuvant trial or a BMS adjuvant trial. So we still took the two-year event-free survival of the most relevant adjuvant trials as our starting point and said, let's see if neoadjuvant therapy can lead to more patients being event-free at two years than adjuvant therapy. And indeed, uh, what we, when this data was presented, we had a, a total of 313 patients randomized, totally event-driven analysis, not, uh, not accrual-driven, but event-driven. So 150-odd in each arm, a few withdrew their consent, a few were still on therapy. Some of them, you know, the, the, these events happened quickly enough that some patients were still on treatment when this study uh, reached its um, endpoint. The uh, groups were well balanced, if anything, a slight, slight predominance of bad factors in the neoadjuvant arm. So the results are dramatic. As I said, we, we had these pre- and intraoperative events, and they're normalized to the same point, and you see that they're essentially almost the same. There are almost equal number of patients on the adjuvant therapy arm who had went to surgery and couldn't go on to adjuvant therapy as there were on the neoadjuvant arm who had progression or toxicity events and couldn't go on to adjuvant therapy. But once we got to that point, the separation was dramatic. The neoadjuvant arm reached that 70 plus percent two-year event-free target we were hoping for, but the adjuvant arm, when we factored in this drop, right, that's the 60 percent from an adjuvant trial minus the 10 or 11 percent that couldn't get to the adjuvant therapy, and the de delta continues as time goes along. Highly statistically significant, a dramatic hazard ratio, and a dramatic difference in absolute two-year event-free survival. And although obviously not mature, already seeing signs that there are fewer deaths among the patients who are randomized to neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, all key subgroups that we had uh, looked at benefited in similar way from the neoadjuvant therapy. And uh, what we still do not have, and we're in the process of analyzing our details about pathologic response in a lot of cases. We have some uh, cases and it's over 20% pathologic CR. But as you can see, there were some patients who had early progression events only a dozen patients of the 159 randomized to neoadjuvant therapy did not go ahead and get surgery. And essentially all but one, the reason was progression outside of the field of the nodal basin or the site of intended surgery. So almost all the progression events were due to areas that wouldn't have been treated if the patient had immediate 
surgery. And obviously there are certainly a lot of responses of just those three uh, cycles of therapy. Uh, as I said, we don't have all the pathologic response rate data, but it's over 20% path CR so far. Um, and just again, to emphasize that the events, they're different because you couldn't have neoadjuvant progression on the adjuvant arm, but the recurrence events are, the tumor related recurrence events are heavily weighed toward the adjuvant arm. So to summarize, event-free survival was significantly longer in the neoadjuvant arm than in the adjuvant arm. Um, there was progression that precluded surgery in some cases, almost always outside of the field. Um, and people had progression events before the start of adjuvant therapy, even if they had surgery right away. So the, the pre-adjuvant events were very well balanced essentially and it was the the difference in this trial is what happened afterward um, so compared to the same treatment given entirely in the adjuvant setting neoadjuvant pembrolizumab followed by adjuvant pembrolizumab improves event-free survival in resectable melanoma and this is one of the most powerful evaluations of the actual impact of giving immunotherapy first while the tumor is present before that immunosuppressive state. These results far exceeded anything that I expected that this study would achieve. I also want to just briefly mention the results with desmoplastic melanoma, which is a small subset of melanomas that are extraordinarily sensitive to immunotherapy due to a very, very high mutation burden. And uh, we've known this, that, that metastatic desmoplastic melanoma is very responsive to immunotherapy. Here's uh, uh, data from a retrospective review showing a 32% complete response rate and a 70% overall response rate for metastatic disease. So it was obvious to try uh, neoadjuvant therapy in this group. Here, the primary endpoint was just to look at response. This isn't a randomized experience. This was a pilot study to see what we could do in this rare population that had never been targeted for a melanoma uh, study and was looking for uh, a 25% or greater complete response rate. Um, and I'll just say that of 29 patients treated with pembrolizumab, 28 underwent resection, one had a clinical complete response uh, and refused uh, to undergo surgery. And one patient discontinued treatment after a single dose, this was my patient, after a single dose of um, immunotherapy due to um, colitis, but still underwent resection later on. Just, uh, this is a standard desmoplastic population, mostly primary, but not all. Um, pembrolizumab was well tolerated as we expected, a variety of different procedures that people underwent. 55% of the patients who had surgery had no, actually 55% of the patients I got treated, not counting the one who was accessible, we didn't count her as a, 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 a CR, 55% pathologic complete response rate, only 45% had any viable cancer uh, detected. So uh, another very successful thing and remarkable rapid responses uh, to the immunotherapy um, and patients doing very well. There have been events, but in fact, most of the events have been deaths from another cause in this elderly patient population rather than uh, events attributable to progression of the disease. So uh, we're going to look at um, tumor mutation burden, uh, but I think this cements neoadjuvant therapy in multiple different aspects of the management of, of resectable melanoma. And I think you're going to 
see this expand and we believe that it should be the preferable treatment and one thing that this committee needs to lead in getting the word out you can't do neoadjuvant therapy if the tumor's not there to assess and monitor we have to get our colleagues across the entire spectrum comfortable with doing needle biopsies of nodal metastases and not just taking these people for remunerative axillary node excisions and so forth. The biopsy has to be done with a core needle or a fine needle to allow adjuvant therapy. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. That was an amazing and fantastic talk with uh, such impressive results. Questions? Josh? Quick question. I know your colleague working on this about stand back is, uh, were the surgeries um, de-escalated in 15 and 12? Um, so we are indeed putting in an abstract together for the uh, SSO for one for each of these two to look in more detail at the surgical considerations. Um, we have been doing one centimeter margins around the desmoplastic cases that had a good clinical response, but most of the de-escalation has been in the avoidance of radiation. All of these patients, every one of these advanced desmoplastics would have had radiation. Among the 29 patients, only one patient had radiation. Now, and I actually asked my patient who had the colitis, are you happy? She had, a, she had one dose, got colitis, had a resection, path CR, no viable tumor, um, avoided dose. radiation from one dose. Said, so, but was it worth it to have colitis for a couple of months versus radiation? And when I asked her the first time, she said yes. When I asked her the second time, when she was still on steroids, she said, I think so, but I'm not so sure. So it is, you know, but now, of course, we can say, and it sure looks like your chance of dying of the disease would be better because you got upfront therapy uh, and many, but, but in the stage two cohort, not all of the patients would have gotten adjuvant therapy, although they all would have been technically candidates for it. So would you say for stage three, based on these results, it's standard, it should be the standard of care? I think that there's no question. It's, it's always been a standard of care, we felt, and we've used it off protocol uh, prior to this, but now I think it should be considered the preferred uh, approach for, for clinical stage three. Uh, and the occasional case of resectable stage four melanoma. Thank you. Uh, yes, you thank know, you. it's it's very clear that the breast cancer the primary tumor somewhat drives the immune therapy response. You know, if you're just putting that three doses of central tumor of time, and that made all the difference in yeah. terms of the long-term oncological outcomes. Now, uh, what work is being done to understand, specifically for this particular study, to um, figure out what is driving this incredible response? Obviously, there's a lot of interest. There are some things that are really hard to study. All of us as surgeons know that there's some immunosuppressive aspects of, of general anesthesia, of the wounding that occurs and the wound re repair that occurs with uh, uh, surgery. That's been known for decades, but never well quantified and certainly not something we could look at a two patients and say, oh, you're more immunosuppressed than the other patient. Um, the tumor-related things, obviously, we have more ability to look at, the, the infiltration of T cells into these tumors. One of the things that's really striking and has uh, opened a whole new cottage industry among our pathologists, the, the histologic patterns of regression are so diverse and heterogeneous, even within the same uh, residual of tumor, sometimes you see fibrosis, sometimes you see melanophages, sometimes it looks like a totally normal lymph node. And we're trying to understand, can we help, can we learn about the recurrence? Yeah, I mean, not the recurrence, the, the remission patterns, does that, uh, you know, impact it? Obviously, the T cells that are in there 
we can study, but what we really want to be able to do is eventually figure out, are you going to respond? The patients have options. They could get BRAF targeted therapy. They could get single agent pembrolizumab. They could get combination. That's that's where we're really going to have to go in the future. This was actually a, a relatively, you know, as I said, a relatively weak neoadjuvant treatment. Yep. And yet, tremendous results. Yeah. Amazing data. Um, have you been storing blood and analyzing like these cell repertoires over time? There's there's quite a bit of that going on to Dr. Rebus's lab in okay. particular is very, very interested in yeah. a lot of these patients, you know, but but we've been interested in that and people who've responded with metastatic disease as well. And uh, I think neoadjuvant gives you a, a unique window because especially uh, to look at the non responders, because you get the tumor that didn't respond. When you got the tumor that did respond, you don't have much to you don't have anything left you have the T cells that killed it, which is good, but you don't have the tumor. Well, yeah, other than the very small initial biopsy right, those of us coming up from the GI side are you know there's a few people who respond right right it's the exact flip side of what's happening, and it does come down to the tumor microenvironment. And probably we're going to stop looking at it at some point based on what the disease is or the organ site but more yes kind of what is that human contact thank you thank you and with that we wrap up the fall swap point to me thank you everyone